you just say when and I'll start acting all official and talking. In, in a waiting room, waiting for the report from somebody. It's not, I don't think it's your report. I could be wrong, but but whatever, it's good. It'd be our, God, it's going to work it out. Hello and good evening, my fine fellow American friends. This is Seoul University. We're at 8229 North 46th Avenue in St. Petersburg, Florida. Still don't know the zip code yet, but I'm sure it's a pretty cool one. I know 34698 is Dunedin and 33774 is Largo, and that's what I know. 33709, if you're GPSing your way here, um, hopefully you're not driving and watching this simultaneously, but if you are, come quickly. And that's important because there's a 46th Street, and if you get off at 46th Street, you're going to have to call Sheila for a ride because it's a ways away. And even if the bus driver tells you that he's lived here his whole life and he knows there's not a Target and a Walmart near North 46th Avenue, you get off at North 46th Avenue. 46th Avenue North. Buck the system. Don't let him let you off at 46th Street and tell you your church is right up the street and you get off and you look and you see it's about 100 yards of concrete and then a fence and a pond on the other side of it. I don't know what street he was looking up. I don't know what church he saw. Maybe he was calling those things that be not as though they were, but it was about 100 yards of pavement. All righty. Seoul University exists to train leaders and lay people, the laity in Christianity to take them to the next level. Uh, there's things that your pastor won't cover in a year that you need to hear. That's no indictment against him. But that's why God put the five-fold ministry in the body and not just the one-fold ministry in the body. And I stand in an office of a teacher and we're going to cover things that God wants you to hear. There's people that teach me that are not necessarily my pastor. And you know what? I receive it because that's God's organizational structure. And you need to be here if you're not here. And there's a reason for it because you'll grow and you'll... you'll I was talking about the office of a pastor earlier. The number one thing a pastor does is he teaches the sheep to succeed in their daily lives. He teaches them how to live successfully. He feeds them knowledge and understanding, and then lo and behold, they begin to multiply and increase. Well, uh, a teacher is going to improve and strengthen your voice as a Christian witness. You're going to be able to know not just that you believe something, but you'll be able to know why you believe something and you'll be able to teach what you know and answer questions about why you know it. It's much more intense than a general Sunday morning service that you can broad brush and cover some things, but you can't get real intimately detailed about in, in a lot of instances because you've got to pull on your spirit from so many different directions. This is not necessarily for the lost. There's you know, we do that. There's evangelistic outreach and meetings, but this is different. Now, if you come and you're not born again, I promise I'll give an altar call. I did last week. But this is primarily for saved people to grow and to grow up and to, and to multiply. And tonight we're talking about women serving God. And I know this is a hot topic in Christianity. Statistics tell us that as, as few as 50 years ago, there were few, if any, females in seminaries in America. Now, there's about half men and half women in seminaries. And evidently, they're going there thinking they're going to get a job somewhere. Evidently, they're going there thinking they have a call to preach or teach. So, either God's gone schizophrenic on us and made a doctrinal, doctrinal change, you know, midstream, or... The word is the word is the word. And he's never changed his mind, but men and women are just now figuring it out. So let's dig into this tonight. I, I talked about this a little bit before we started filming, but talking about women serving God and serving in ministry, on a GPS system in your car, they, they intentionally chose a woman's voice. And that traces all the way back to World War II fighter pilots who 
they were trying to get them to react in combat in combat situations to quick uh, actions and maneuvers in the cockpit. They tried lights flashing. They, they started with a man's voice. And then they realized, you know what? A woman's voice is so distinctly different than a man's, men would respond quicker. So now they've even matured that whole process to where when you enlist, you bring a cassette or a CD of your mom, your daughter, or your sister's voice, or all three, and then they put their voices in a recording and they spit out to you uh, your instructions. So it's very likely you would hear your daughter saying, Daddy, press this button. Daddy, turn the flaps up. Because you're more likely to respond in stressful, tense situations to your, the female voices of your family than a total stranger or something. So then you go to your GPS system. And it says, finding, and, and I pulled this off the internet, these are some quotes, finding a female voice that is pleasing to almost everyone is infinitely easier than finding a male voice. Humans are more attuned to female voices from birth. Even in the womb, a fetus will be able to distinguish a mother's voice from all other voices and will not be able to distinguish the father's voice. And then when the key dimension in what you're doing is likability, the female voice is the better choice. So where we've created this prejudice towards women teaching and ministering and preaching, it's not even biologically common sense. I mean, this is a, this is a thing from, from somewhere else. Even nature tells us that we are listening for our mom's voice, a female's voice. And, and with that said, think about it. I mean, what happens all of a sudden, your whole entire life, your mom, who's the, everybody knows between men and women, men have about this many words per day that they're going to speak, and then when they're done, they're done. Women are like the little energizer bunny, and they just go on and on and on, and it's not going to stop. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just simply saying it's about a five to one vocabulary ratio in the course of a day. So here's your mom with at least twice the verbal input into you your whole life. And now all of a sudden, because of God, she can't tell you anything that your creator says because she's a woman? That doesn't even make common sense, much less biblical sense. Your mom teaches you right from wrong. She teaches you to look both ways before you cross the street. She helps you with your homework. She teaches you the golden rule. All the wisdom that your mom gave you that works stems from the Bible either way. She didn't just make that up on her own. That's not a female thing. She got that stuff from God. This, this thing that was out there just recently called the secret, all those, biblical, all those principles were biblical principles. They just didn't give Jesus credit for it. Imaging, that's Jacob. Jacob was tired of having his wages changed so many times by Laban. And so he swindled Laban out of his livestock using imaging. Imagizing is, imagizing is what it's called. He's told, he told Laban, he says, look, all I have for all these years I've worked for you is just my family and the clothes on my back. I'm going to leave, and so I want to I wanna divvy up the, the cattle that I've produced for you, the, the goats and the sheep. I'm going to take all the ring-straked and speckled animals, and then you have the others. And Laban was like, what a deal, because I don't have any animals like that. And La Jacob said, I'm going to feed them one more time, and then we'll... we'll, we'll Split them, up, split them up. So Jacob, knowing the principle of what you see is what you get, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Obviously it works for an animal. He, put, he stripped the bark off of trees and put ring strakes and speckled spots in the watering trowel where they would mate. And he even went so far as to only put it in front of the strong animals and not the weak ones. So when they mated, what they were looking at was ring strakes and spots. And so when their animals came out, their offspring came out, all of a sudden, they've got ring strakes and spots on it. And Jacob takes almost all of Laban's uh, animals, except for the little sickly ones, using that principle. But they came out with this book called The Secret. You know, positive thoughts, positive images. All of that comes from the Bible. We just didn't, they just didn't give Jesus credit for it. The devil is not a creator. God is a creator. He twists and manipulates and counterfeits. He doesn't create. He doesn't have, a, he's a destroyer. 
Some of you just got set free right there. God is the creator. G the devil is the destroyer. There's no good in the devil. He is chaos on demand. Now, I want you to go and look at um, Psalm 68 and 11. We're just going to start right there. I don't want you to take my word for all this. I want you to see it for yourself. There's, there's nothing like putting the Bible in front of your eye gate. And I'm going to give you about four different translations of this one verse so you can see my point here. Psalm 68 and 11. In the Amplified Bible says this right here. The Lord gives the word of power. The women who bear and publish the news are a great host. Now in the King James, it doesn't even mention the word woman. If you don't have access to these other translations, you would never know that the, the gender specific tense of the verb, or of the noun in that sentence is, is feminine. You would just think, Maybe you think angels or it's just all men or something. But it's very specific. Listen to the NIV. The Lord announces the word and the women who proclaim it are a mighty throng. The Young's literal translation, the Lord doth give the saying, the female proclaimers are a numerous host. The New American Standard Bible, the Lord gives the command, the women who proclaim the good tidings are a great host. So this thing about women and they can't teach and they can't preach and all that, that's a lot of pit of hell. Let me just explain it to you like this. 80% of the Christian workforce in the local church is women. So now all of a sudden, if you're the devil, you're nervous because they talk. I mean, they, whether or not, they just word of choice of our warfare. The Bible says that in the power of the tongue is life and death. That you can bless or you can curse with your words. The Bible says that you receive salvation using words. In Romans 10, 8, 9, and 10, you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. For with the heart, man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses unto salvation. You receive salvation from God, believing in your heart, confessing with your mouth, using words. Everything you get from God, you use words to get it. Your life, you are sitting right now in the condition of your life as a product of the words that you've spoken over the entire course of your life. Your faith, will not rise above the level of the words that you speak. If you constantly speak curses and doubts, guess what you will always have chasing you down in life? Curses and doubts. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You won't even have faith arise on the scene without spoken words. So if you're the enemy and you realize eight of every ten of your enemies are females, you've got to hurry up and come up with something quick. And so we need to just tempt the first one in a, in a conversation, in the war of words, and just look. See, even Eve, she can't even... Eve misquoted what God told Adam. Adam, God didn't tell Adam you can't touch the fruit on the tree. You could juggle it. You could throw it against a wall. You could play golf with it, but just don't eat it. But the devil said, D has he not said you can't? Uh, mess with the tree and she says he says you can't touch it and all this stuff he got her tripping over her words so he's, he uses little you ever done that you've made one mistake I burnt pizza crust the other night I don't ever burn stuff definitely not pizza crust and I have it wound up making spaghetti instead of pizza now it, I hope that person doesn't think that I'm a terrible cook because anybody who knows me knows that's not the case but I got busy talking I was, the, what I should have done was I should just stop the whole natural thing and shared the words that they were, they were wanting to talk about some stuff and I should have just gone with that and left the cooking thing alone. But because I got tripping on myself, I burnt something as silly as, so hopefully they're not going to hold that against me. 
Well, you can't do that with Eve, and you can't say all women are, you know, you, you, but we broad brush stuff. It's lazy. It's easy to do that. Prejudice is the laziest thing. Doubt is the laziest thing you can possibly do. It takes effort to believe. It takes effort to have faith and to walk in love. And when we throw women out, you know, like that, there goes eight of ten Holy Ghost mouthpieces of the church right there. And men who are less likely to talk and use words are now his only opposition from the pulpit? He's got it made in the shade. That's ridiculous. Why would You wouldn't do that on a basketball team. You wouldn't bench eight of your ten most active players unless you're trying to lose every game you play. Who are you going to put in? <laughs> the mascot? You know? It's, it just Nothing about it makes common sense. I realize that it's easier for a man to handle pastoral responsibilities by and large than a woman from, a, from certain viewpoints. But that doesn't mean that you can make a doctrine out of that. And God uses whoever is available and you, and, and you can get in trouble telling God what he can and cannot do because he ain't asking anybody's permission to put a lady in the pastorate. He's not, a, in fact, this church is pastored by a lady. The most amazing move of God I've ever seen in my life personally I was ministering in a church in Ghana, in Teshi, in, in 2009, was pastored by a lady. And most of the church was ladies because they, the men didn't want to be pastored by a woman because of the same religious devil we're talking about right now. You can't put God in a box. I understand accountability and things. Well, put your things in place. Men have to do the same thing. I'm guessing more men have fallen from the pastorate than women because of infidelity. I'm, I'm sure the percentages are higher for the men than the women. But anyway, moving right along. Another myth is um, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 34, and 35, where women are not permitted to even speak in a church service. Oh, my goodness. First of all, you could make that happen anyway, even if it was biblical. Because of women communicate. They talk. That's what they do. Thank God for it. It's a whole lot more exciting place to be around than just sitting in a room with a bunch of guys grunting at each other. You know, what are you doing? Well, we're watching each other grow. <laughs> you know, <laughs> staring at our toenails and stuff. Thank God for women. 1 Corinthians 14, 34 and 35. Hope I'm not going to get in trouble. Lord, help me. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Let your women keep silent in the churches, uh, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Well, see right there, Brother Eric, women are not supposed to speak. It says it plain as day. Well, Job's wife also told him to curse God and die, but I'm not going to make a doctrine out of that either. Everything that's in the Bible was inspired to be in the Bible. It's supposed to be in there. But that doesn't mean that everything that's said is exactly, you've got to rightly divide the word. Let's just look at fallacy number one. The word for women in that verse is the Greek word number 1135, and it means wife not women it means wife see even the translators they did the same thing in Psalm 68 and 11 who wrote this Bible this was this was King James England they 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 had problems with this it's, it, it appears here again they had problems with with it, anybody besides a noble being wealthy and there's some instances in the Old Testament where, where prosperity is promised to any believer. And they had a problem with it, and so they wrote it in such a way, they instead of saying, like the forces of the Gentiles, it should say the wealth of the Gentiles will come into you. But they say forces because they couldn't understand that common people could have wealth and riches, only the nobility. You just have to watch how you, you divide this thing. But anyway, that's number one. The word is wife, not women. Secondly, look at that verse. It says, uh, and if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. 
Now, is there anybody in here that's a woman that's not married? Raise your hand. There's one right there. So, what is she supposed to do? She can't go home and ask her husband anything because she doesn't have one. Again, we're pointing out that this is the word wife. Now, why does he use the word wife? Well, I've seen this cultural thing in my, in my travels. Um, at thi at when this was written, the women of Corinth were much, much less, if educated at all, than their husbands. And what would happen is, is the women would sit on the right and the men would sit on the left or vice versa, whichever floated their boat. And the speaker would be speaking. And I'm going to show you in a minute that it wasn't always a man that was speaking because there's a couple named Priscilla and Aquila that we're going to get into in a minute and she served right there with him and in some instances Paul mentions her name before he mentions his name and they co-pastored a church so if Priscilla was speaking the rule would still apply the women would hear the speaker say something and not understand what was being said because they didn't have the education they would holler over at their husband because they weren't sitting together because it was not culturally custom for that whereas now you know, well, in some kids, I've seen some sit apart, but that's not because of culture. That's because um, the, the dinner was burnt or, or something. A bill wasn't paid. But anyway, and she would say, what is he talking about? Well, what happens if two or three people are hollering while you're trying to minister? It grieves the Spirit of God. So Paul said, for the sake of the order of the service, tell these ladies to wait until they get home and ask their husband what was going on. Well, that isn't the case today. Women are as or more educated than men. It might be the other way around. Now, honey, what's he talking And I've seen this. The pa pastor will say, turn to 1 Kings chapter 17, and he'll go, Kings, now is that in the Bible? Honey, where is that? And they're just talking, talking, and she's like, <sighs> flips right to it, you know. I've seen, you know. Bib a generation of biblical illiterates or like the night I got born again the spirit of God says go home and read the book of Job and I said Job Job how do I even know you're telling me the truth I might be hearing Job and you're saying Job and you're saying Job and he says well you're an English major look in the table of contents you'll find it now moving right along notice how many times in the epistles, in the last day's dis dispensation, that women are mentioned in acts of service, prophesying, pastoring. I'm going to read you some scriptures here. Uh, Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For This is um, Acts chapter 2, verse 23. Or, so, I'm sorry, Joel chapter 2, verse 23. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, as it's raining outside, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil, and I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And you will eat in plenty and be satisfied. So he's describing a a turn, a shift, a major change in worship and spiritual activity. And look at he, who he's going to include in on this. Uh, you'll eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. So what he's telling you, there's no shame in his game which is coming up. You shall know that I'm in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else and my people shall never be ashamed. So he's telling you, what I'm about to do will not bring shame or reproach or confusion upon you. What's about to happen. Peter quotes this on the day of Pentecost at the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Verse 28, and it shall come to pass. Again, I'm the, he's not asking our permission. It's going to come to pass. That I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your shall see visions. And also upon the servants and the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. Go with me to Isaiah 61. Just in case you're wondering 
what, what the outpouring of that Spirit is supposed to be doing. And he's telling you right here, it's for the women as well as for the men. In Isaiah 61 and 1, Jesus quotes this in his first sermon. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. If the Spirit of God comes upon somebody, guys, I, I promise you there's going to be some preaching involved. Whether it's up here or whether it's back here or out there, when the Spirit comes upon anybody, there's going to be anointed, divinely inspired words coming out of your mouth. That's the first thing Jesus said the Spirit was upon him to do. He has sent me to buy, but it's to the meek. It's not for the prideful people. I don't waste my time with prideful, I don't waste my time with idiots. And not, that doesn't mean that, that, see, if they're meek, they're saved. No, because some lost people are meek, and some saved people are, are not. There's the two illustrations. There's the one guy who's like, I tithe, I do this, I do that, I'm so righteous. And then there's this other guy going, I'm not even worthy to lift my eyes to heaven. And Jesus says, who do you think went home justified? Not that guy, this guy. And he was like a publican or something. He wasn't even a saved guy. It goes on and it says, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. If you're going to be binding up anybody's broken heart, it's going to be with words. It's going to be with a hug, with resources. And, and who do you call? Guys, you, you, you break up with your girlfriend, or your girlfriend breaks up with you, you go through a tough time. 865-556-4993. That's my mom's cell phone number. That's who you call. It doesn't mean you're a mama's boy. It just means that's your mom. And she knows you. She can bind up your broken heart. Or if you're married, you call your wife. You know, if you're close with your siblings, you call your sister. Because the guy's probably going to say, well, I don't know, man. Let's just go shoot some ball or something. <laughs> or just get over it, you know. Or like, they'll grunt. Oh, okay. Well, sorry, man. I hate that for you. But a, but a lady, anointed by the Spirit, will raise you and lift you and get your feet headed in the right direction with skill and accuracy. Women hear sound six times greater than men do. Women hear in a wider parameter, audibly, and respond to the, to, the, to the color of red greater than men do. Women see and hear the bigger picture. Genetically, they're made that way. Men have a greater ability to, to utilize and deal with three-dimensional spatial reasoning, but women see this wide broad brush type deal you're going to shut that up you're going to have a bunch of bitter old people running around <laughs> all right you can read the rest of this chapter verse 2 and verse 3 remember the voice that you shut the voice that you close in your life be the blind spot you walk around with for the rest of your life if you if you if you keep women from ministering a thus saith the Lord to you. I mean, I hope you can make do with what God does with the two of the ten men that are left in your life to minister to you. I hope they've got a big, great dose of Holy Ghost anointing because you just told eight of the ten people God could have used to help you, no thanks, because women can't preach or teach me or anything. It's just, it doesn't even make natural sense. In the epistles, we see over and over the writers singling out various ones for the labors and faithfulness and laying the foundation for our church age. Here is Priscilla co-pastoring with her husband Achilla and praised repeatedly by Paul, mentioned first on several occasions too. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16 and 19, he says, The churches of Asia salute you. Achilla and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. Now, we're already in a male-dominated society back in this day anyway. There was no need to include a, a Priscilla in there if she wasn't actually worth mentioning. He would not have offended anybody if he'd have left her name off. What was Noah's wife's name? You don't know. But she's mentioned five times. But you don't know her name. If he mentions her name, there's a reason. 
Now in Romans 16 and 3, he says it this way. Greet. He's writing f- and he says, Greet Priscilla and Achilla, my helpers in Christ Jesus. So now he's put Priscilla's name in front of Achilles. Now listen to what they do. Acts 18 and 26. Let's go there. This is, this is no little thing we're talking about here. We might be all cool with it in here, but you get out there and start talking about women preaching and women teaching and pastoring, and you better have your armor on. <laughs> you better. They'll be, they'll be shooting you down. But if you get armed with this information, you can successfully navigate all their stones and tomatoes. Let's start in verse 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the Scriptures. So this is no little, you know, deputy doodah guy here. This is, this, is the, this, is a, this is a Billy Graham. An eloquent man and mighty in the Scriptures came to Ephesus. <coughs> This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the Spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. He would be like what you would consider a denominational Christian. Saved, going to heaven, water baptized, loves God, reads the Bible, but he's not yet been acquainted with the baptism with the Holy Ghost, among other things. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. He's a self-starter, a public face, a public figure, whom when Achilla and and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them. You never see their names separated. And expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. They got him Holy Ghost baptized. How do I know that? We'll look at Acts chapter 19 verse 1. And it came to pass that while Paul, Apollos was at Corinth, Paul having passed through the upper coast came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. So he's now in Ephesus where Achille and Priscilla are. And what does he do? He finds some disciples who he says, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? They said, We've not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he says unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Same as um, same as Apollos above. Ephesus, man, if you were flying through Ephesus and you weren't Holy Ghost filled, get ready. Ephesus was a slippery creek bank for the Holy Ghost baptism. You got Paul getting them filled in verse 6. And when he laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them. They spake with tongues and prophesied. And up in chapter 18, verse uh, 26, and Achilla and Priscilla took him aside and expounded him the way of God more perfectly. And and then it goes on. So Achilla and Priscilla co-laboring. Holy Ghost filled. Powerful men and women of God. Paul himself put her name first on more than one occasion in these scriptures. But it didn't start in the New Testament. This is not like a New Testament grace. Go back to Judges uh, chapter 4 and verse 4. We were talking about this earlier. Judges is right at the very beginning of your Bible. Chapter 4, verse 4. And Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, she judged Israel at that time. She may as well have been queen mother of Israel. What she said went. Don't pass go. Don't collect $200 until you've gone to talk to Deborah about it. And she's a prophetess. So if you don't come talk to her, she's going to know it. (laughs) She dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah. They named a tree after her. Between Ramah and Bethel in Mount Ephraim, and the children of Israel came up to her for judgment, which means they publicly laid their pompous pride aside and went to Mama Deborah and said, Hey, we need some help. Remember how they did Moses? And Jethro told Moses, If you don't start delegating this out, you're going to wear out. And they're going to wear out too? Well, this is what they were doing with Deborah. Where do you think they got that from? That's that same train. Judge means judge. Discern. Decide between. Hand out law. Hand out government. Hand out rule. If she speaks it, it's done. 
And she sent and called Barak, the son of Abinoam. She sent and had Barak. Let me just say that name again for you. She sent and called for Barak. The son of Abinoam of Kadesh Naphtali and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying... Wait a minute, I didn't think women were permitted to speak in church. I sure didn't think they were allowed to preach and teach and testify and prophesy. Oh, she was under a palm tree. She's having country church. She must have been from Tennessee. Because you know I don't have to go to church. I can go out in the woods and me and God and do our thing. I don't know what you're going to do if it rains, if it snows, if it gets cold. But anyway, she rebukes him. This is the commander of the army. This is the man who could blow her head off. And he takes it. Let, let's, let's, this is an interesting conversation here. Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor, and take with thee with the 10,000 men? She's handing out orders for 10,000 men. What's the last woman you know that's been over 10,000 men in anything? And it was from the Lord. And nobody had a problem with it. I mean, can you imagine her rise to power? David's was tough enough. And he was a good looking guy who could kick tail. What did Deborah have to go through? But you know, if the sp this is for whoever's in here and whoever's watching. If the Spirit of God has called you to do something, you can forget the gender thing. Because God will make straight the crooked places. And he'll break in sunder the gates of iron. You know that word gates is also the word for utterances? Those utterances that come at you, those religious spirits, those religious, religious traditions, I almost said delicious traditions, delicious to the devil, those, those walls that you can't scale, those utterances, those Jesus said the traditions of men have made the word of God of no effect. There is something more powerful than God on this earth and it's your traditions. <sighs> well, at least for now. There's a day coming when it ain't going to matter because every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. But if you're in here and you're a lady or you got a mom or you got a sister or you got a wife or somebody, God's got his hand on their life, don't be in the way. And don't be intimidated by the, the utterances of society and systems. And Go with me to Acts chapter 2 verse 8. I'm going to... This is for somebody. Maybe they're, they're watching now. They'll watch the archives that are in here now. I don't, go to Psalm 2 and 8. I was talking earlier. Um, this day has been a tremendous day of political importance around the world. Even if for us nationally, how we treat Israel is crucial. And they're over there at the UN today determining whether they're, they're going to divide up Israel or not into a, a Palestinian state. And then in Zambia, they had national elections today. Zambia was a, a socialist, fascist nation up in the 60s. And then the last three presidents have been Pentecostal and or evangelical born-again Christians. And they want to keep that trend going because their nation's turning around. Um, but anyway, this is a, a political thing we're talking about here with Deborah. Psalm 2 and 8 and then, you know, there's the, the church politics. There, there's no stopping God. All right. This is what he thinks about all that. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. It could be Deborah. It could be Sheila. It could be Donna. It could be anybody. These are these little backroom deals that people do. Politics. Well, she's a woman. I know, man, she's really anointed to do this. Yeah, she's a woman. What's that going to look like? Well, my Bible's saved. <laughs> yeah, we're getting there. I'm at, I start at Psalm 2 and verse 1. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. 
Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You'll dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. If the Lord put his stamp of approval on the woman, that's Jesus himself. And you start fighting her, you'll be fighting God. And God said, I'm laughing at the derision you're going to go under. Just the best thing you can do is just, if you find that your theology previously was one thing and you see from the word that it, it's, it's off, drop yours and go with the word. That's the safest thing that you can do. What do I get out of preaching this message? I have no intended reward in my mind. I'm not thinking of anything. I'm not trying to get anything. I'm simply telling you what was on my heart to share. I, I don't know that I get kudos or points for this in heaven. He preached, you know, about women preaching was a good thing. I'm simply expounding to you the way of God more perfectly, if you will. Women are called just as much as men are. And you, you've, you've got to get out of the way. You've got to let them do what God's called them to do. Help them, support them. Submit to them and honor them. You don't have any problem with submitting to your mom. Hopefully you don't. The Bible says one of the Ten Commandments, the first one with the promise is, is honor your mother and your father. It doesn't say, say your father. It says your mother. And consequently it says you, you'll leave your mother and your father and cleave unto your wife another woman. You're not escaping women on this earth. Dude, you can forget it. They're everywhere. You got here by one. If you didn't, you're an alien. You're an illegal resident on earth if you got here th from some other way than a woman. Unless you're Adam, it didn't happen. I don't know if he had a belly button. Go ask God. I don't know. And, and so then, going back to Judges chapter 4, And she said, and she hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor, and take with thee ten thousand men of the children of Naphtali and of the children of Zebulon. And I will draw unto thee to the river Kishon Sisera, captain of Jabin's army with his chariots and multitude. And I will deliver him into your hand. And Barak said unto her, If you'll go with me, then I'll go. Seriously. This is the Bible. But if you don't go with me, I'm not going. <laughs> I mean, you can draw your own conclusions. But now this is what the Word says. And then she said, Oh, I'll go with thee. But the journey that you take will not be for your honor. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. And it goes on, and, and if you go to verse um, 18, And Jael went out to meet Sisera and said unto him, Turn in, my lord, turn in to me, fear not. Jael was a, a Midianite, probably descendant of Jethro and his people, Moses' father-in-law, who did walk after God, particularly because of Moses' influence. But um, so Sisera, the king of, of the Midianites, thought it was probably safe. He's on the run for his life and he's thirsty. So he sees Jael, and they probably look alike skin color wise, and she's like, come on in here. It'll be all right. I'll, you know, it's cool. So he goes in there, and it says, um, when he turned into her into the tent, she covered him with a mantle. And he said unto her, give me, I pray thee, a little water to drink, for I'm thirsty. And she opened a bottle of milk and gave him drink and covered him. Again, he said unto her, Stand in the door of the tent, and it shall be when any man doth come and inquire of thee, and say, Is there any man here? Thou shalt say, No. Then Jael, Heber's wife, took a nail of the tent, and took a hammer in her hand, and went softly unto him, and smote the nail. I mean, she snuck upon him ninja style. And went softly unto him, and smote the nail into his temples, and fastened into the ground, for he was fast asleep and weary, and so he died. And so behold, as Barak pursued Sisera, Jael came out to meet him and said unto him, Come, and I will show thee the man whom thou seekest. And when he came into her tent, behold, Sisera lay dead, and the nail was in his temples. So God subdued, say that with me, God subdued on that day, Jabin, 
but he did it by the hand of a woman. At the orders originating from a woman. And the man said, even though you're telling me what God wants me to do, if you don't go with me, I'm not going to do it. Now, if God can do this anointing in Deborah's life, he's no respecter of persons. He's a respecter of faith. And while we're on it, God loves you all just the same. You're never going to get God to change how he loves you. You can't do good enough long enough to increase his love for you. You can't do bad enough long enough to get him to decrease his love for you. He loves the folks in hell just like he loves us. He provided for the folks in hell's salvation before they were ever even born. In his mind, it was a done deal. They just either refused it or didn't know about it. But he is not always pleased with us. Some he's pleased with more than others. And sometimes he's pleased with you and sometimes he's not. He's never angry with you. He said, there's coming a day and this is that day. This is the age of grace. I'm not angry with you, but I'm definitely not pleased with some of you sometimes. Hebrews 11.6, without faith, it's impossible to please God. If you're not in faith, you're not pleasing God. And if you're against women preachers, I'm sorry. I'm going to say it. Now, I'm not sorry. You're not in faith. So you're not pleasing God. Because we're, I mean, we're pounding it here. I don't know what Bible you read out of, but this is what the Word says. And besides that, they're popping up everywhere. You can't, I don't, well, whether you believe in women preachers or not doesn't mean that they don't exist. <laughs> Your disbelief is not keeping them from cropping up all over the earth. They're, sorry. <laughs> you know, but that's just how it is. I don't know what your problem with women is, whoever you are, I don't think you're in here, but you need to really re reevaluate the attitude of your heart, the tenderness, the softness of your conscience before the Holy Spirit. You're grieving Him. You know, I, I, this is totally off the subject, and this is not tonight's message, but I'm going to say this too. I did a breakfast club for kids in a middle school in Knoxville, Tennessee. A breakfast club is where I go get food from stores for them for free, free to them, not to me. And I use it as a hook to get kids to come in and hear the gospel before school starts in the gym or the auditorium or a classroom. And I've got like 200 middle school kids coming to this club at a middle school in West Knoxville. And there's some African-American kids that are bussed in to try to balance out the numbers. Great kids, totally listen to the message, never cause a problem. I'm shooting basketball, hanging out with them after the message. And the one little guy just out of the blue says, you know, there's no black people in the Bible. Now he's coming to a Christian club, pays attention every week, but he's got this skewed image and he's had help to arrive there at this conclusion. Jesus, I'm sorry to tell you, didn't have blonde hair and blue eyes. Well, it's po he could have blue eyes, but he didn't have blonde hair. And he's a whole lot dark, darker skin than what the pictures show him to be. Now, I don't believe he was African, so I'm not saying that. But he's more olive-skinned. But he wasn't pale and blonde-headed and Scandinavian looking. So, the, you know, but that's, you know, if that's what gets you to heaven, go with it. Indians over in India won't allow American actors in their Jesus movies but if you put all Indian actors in the Jesus movie, which is not ethnically correct, hundreds upon thousands of people will come and give their hearts to the Lord. It's whatever floats your boat there. Just make sure the story's correct. So I went and I said, Lord, there's got to be a theologically correct answer for this kid. Walk me through this. So I started with Ham, who is generally considered the father of all people of color. His name means black or hot and I traced their genealogies I traced who they married what they did the names of their tribes what their names meant and I've got about 35 significant stories so far Old Testament New Testament men and women people of color partially or completely my my paradigm shifted from where the Bible took place in my mind it was mostly North Africa and the middle near East as opposed to, I don't know where I thought it took place. I don't know. But the, bi the biblical narrative, by and large, takes place in Africa and the Near East. Arabia, 
people of color. We're all through the Bible. By my count, the, the Europeans in the Bible were the Roman soldiers that helped put Jesus on the cross. There's a couple good guys in there, but by and large, they're not the good guys in the biblical narrative. Japheth and his descendants, generally speaking, are not doing too many positive things in the Bible. Just food for thought there. But anyway, so we, we do the same thing with women. There's no women preachers. Can you see how the devil magnifies difference in hate? Whereas God magnifies difference in love? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, early evangelist hero Philip was graced with helpers in his work. His four prophesying virgin daughters, Acts 21 and 8. How would you know his daughters had the ability to prophesy? They were in a church meeting, probably in his house. And guess what? The Spirit of God came upon them. They were prophesying. That's how you know. The proof is in the pudding. And the next day we that were of Paul's company departed and came into Caesarea and we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist which is one of the seven and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins which did prophesy. If they were out of order, if it was wrong, if it was not biblical, Paul would have rebuked them. Luke was there too. Luke had just as much authority as Matthew and Mark and John and all these fellas and Peter. And he could have corrected it because Luke wrote this book. And it doesn't mention anywhere where any man's told these women to shut up. That would probably not be a wise choice anyway. Not if you care for your life. Notice how many women appear in Paul's benediction. I commend unto you Phoebe our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Centuria. What are some of the things a servant of the church does? Okay, they vacuum, they cook cookies, they watch kids. But they're going to teach. They're going to visit people. They're going to pray for people. They might be called upon to minister a word. They might be in a deliverance ministry. Servant could mean a... Because he calls men servants of the church, and we don't have a problem at all thinking about them speaking. I mean, if it's a woman, it, does, it just runs contrary to their even very nature. Why would God make a verbal creature and then tell them to put tape over their mouth? Why would he do that? That you receive her in the Lord. See, he, he, he do just what I'm doing. Correcting this, the thinking out. As become a saint. And that you assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you. Whatever she needs, you do. Oh my. For she hath been a succour or a winner of an evangelist of many and of myself also. Greet Priscilla and Achilla. We're on two out of the three characters are women. And one of them, he said, he gave them, gave them the keys to the church. And the fridge and all that's in it. Who have from my life laid down their own necks. Unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. If they were out of order then all the churches would have been rebuking them and correcting them and telling them to shut up. And I guarantee you, if he told this church, give her whatever she needs, he told the other ones too. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Co-pastors. Salute my, my, well, my well-beloved Epiphanes, who is the firstfruits of Achaia unto Christ. Greet Mary... Here we go again. Who bestowed much labor on us. Salute Adronicus and Junia. Junia is feminine. Anything ending in an A is feminine. 
my kinsmen, that's his relative, and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles. Junia was a female apostle. But I thought women couldn't preach. Not only can he preach, but they can flow in an apostolic anointing, which means as God needs them to, they will be an apostle, which is a missionary, a sent one to a people, to a place, to create a church from nothing. They will flow in the gift of the office of a prophet. They will flow in the gift of the office of an evangelist, a teacher, or a pastor, because that's what an apostle does in the New Testament. At any given time, he flows in any of those fivefold offices as the need arises. When you get to a place, there's no converts. You go get them saved. You're an apostle. For the fact that you got there means you were sent there. That's apostolic. Then when they start coming, you've got to teach them because they don't know anything. And then over a period of time until another pastor comes in, you're going to pastor them and shepherd them. And then as the need arises, you're going to prophetically draw attention to specific revelation and truth that that church needs to hear. If you go to the book of Revelation, you'll see the seven churches that Jesus told John to address these specific points in these specific churches. That's the office of a prophet. Greet Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. Salute Urbane and our helper in Christ and Stachys, my beloved. Salute Apelles, approved in Christ. Aristobulus' household. Herodian, my kinsman. Narcissus. Salute Tryphena and Tryphosa. There's two more women who labor in the Lord. Salute the beloved Persis, which labored much in the Lord. Salute Rufus, in chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Salute Asyncritus, Phlegion, Hermas, Petrobus, Hermes, and the brethren which are with them. Philogus, Julia, there's another one. Nereus and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints which are with them. Salute one another with the holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. This is out of the book of Romans, last chapter. In Philippi, Paul commends more ladies who served with him to further the gospel. Philippians 4 and 3, And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. Here in John, he's writing to the chosen lady in 2 John chapter 1, The elder unto the elect lady and her children whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also they that have known the truth. Here is Apia, another lady helper in ministry, Philemon 1 and 2. And to our beloved Apia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. She's listed before him. Hopefully you can see that there is no respecter of persons with God, <coughs> only a respecter of faith. I had, a, I had a, a, a person write in about this on Facebook. And it's, uh, it's a female minister. I won't give her name. She says... God bless you for teaching the flock. I can't tell you how many times doors have been closed in my face <coughs> because I was a woman and not because of the word being preached. I had one pastor that would acknowledge me as an evangelist but refused to license me because he didn't believe women should be licensed. Paul was addressing not just the women but the spirit behind these women. You've got to understand the culture of the day in Corinth to understand why he was telling the women to be quiet. And we went over that. You know, to receive someone as an evangelist, but then to not license them, sounds like a Chinese fire drill. It doesn't make a bit of sense. That sounds like the epitome of confusion. And what is licensing going to do anyway? God sent them. If you recognize as much as your tradition flies in your face that, look, they're an evangelist. I'm not going to license them, but I'm not going to deny they're an evangelist. Who's, who's got the problem? That person has the problem. That religious tradition, that system has a problem. What is it that God put in her? Look at, look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, and then we'll end with this this first class. Look at Ephesians 4.11. And he gave who? God. He ascended on high. He laid captivity captive. And he gave gifts unto men. This lady was a gift. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ 
till we all come in the unity of the faith and to a perfect man and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro. This man, this system is flying in the face of God-ordained organization and gifting. If you receive me as Brother Eric, that's what you're going to get, is Brother Eric. But if you receive the anointing on my life, then that's what you're going to get. You get out of it what you put into it. And, and, you know, I did some correcting recently in a church where, you know, they're just buddied up with the pastor. His name was Eric. Hey, Eric, come over here. You don't need a buddy. You need a spiritual father. You need to be rebuked. You need to be corrected. You need to be taught. You need to be encouraged. You need to be affirmed. You don't need buddies. There's plenty of those. You need to respect your men and women of God as such. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I believe I delivered this first class the word that I was supposed to. I pray that this word would bear fruit, penetrate the hearts and minds and lives of those viewing and those here and those who will see it later and as it's retaught. And I bind the devil from stealing this word from our heart. I pray that it would grow up and bear fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold in our lives. I thank you for it, Lord, in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Guys, I'm going to give us a quick break here.